My sermon passages are 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 18 to 26, and then Luke chapter 2, verses 41 to 52. First Samuel 2, 18 to 26. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy girded with a linen ephod, and his mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, the Lord give you children by this woman for the loan which she lent to the Lord. So then they would return to their home. And the Lord visited Hannah, and she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. And the boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. Now Eli was very old, and he heard all that his sons were doing to all Israel, and how they lay with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. And he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. No, my sons, it is no good report that I hear the people of the Lord spreading around. If a man sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to slay them. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and with men. Now Luke 2, 41 to 52. <clears throat> Now Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the company, they went a day's journey. And they saw him among their kinfolk and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. After three days, they found him in the temple sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been looking for you anxiously. And he said to them, How is it that you sought me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying which he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. And his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. The word of the Lord. May God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. Did you ever think the term dysfunctional family was redundant? <laughs> dysfunctional family. If you ever did think so, you're not alone. No family was ever perfect, starting with the very first one. Adam blamed Eve, Eve blamed the serpent, and it got them all tossed out of the garden. And Jesus' family wasn't perfect either. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3, it says they thought he was out of his mind. They went once to where he was teaching, and somebody said, Hey, your mom and brothers are here. They're outside. And Jesus said, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking around at those sitting and listening to him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. So if you've got a little dysfunction in your family, and it can get real noticeable this time of year. You're in good company. But maybe the dysfunction is in you. I know I have some in me. I never really got Blue Christmas church services until this year. I mean, I knew in my head, but I didn't know in my heart. Blue Christmas worship on the longest night of the year, the winter solstice, usually December 21st. It keeps growing in popularity because it can be so hard, so hard to feel joy and hope and love and peace of this season for some people. Blue Christmas is a time to remember those who, that we've lost and to confess our grief to God and to one another and to share the burden of pain with God and with one another. 
And I get it now. Even without a blue Christmas service, last year will forever be in a class by itself. So this was really my first Christmas without my brother, Carl, and my sister, Joanne. So Christmas for me is now forever different and in a different way from when my parents passed. It's different. I get it. The love I have for both my brother and sister, as well as the, at times, vicious, vicious disagreements I had with my brother Carl, left wounds. Love leaves wounds. Dysfunctional or functional, love hurts. And the Christmas season makes it hurt worse when memories that tug on heartstrings also irritate scars. We all had them. One way or another, we're all messed up. Most of the families depicted in the Bible are messed up. That's part of what it means to be human. And healing, seeking it and getting it or learning to live without it, is part of what it means to be holy. Even holy families, H-O-L-Y, which means set apart for God, are wholly human, W-H-O-L-L-Y, fully human. Some are set apart by healing. Some are set apart by God's grace and mercy to live with, to live with human frailties and limitations. The passage from 1 Samuel depicts two holy set apart for God families. The young Samuels, who will become a great prophet, and old, and old Eli, a mediocre priest, who raised two sons who became great, which also shows human frailties and limitations. Both young Samuel and Eli's sons are free to choose. Samuel chooses to serve the Lord, and the sons choose to serve themselves. But all were set apart and dedicated to God from birth. They were free, but obliged. Kind of like being baptized as an infant, in a family committed to raising a thinking Christian and then going through confirmation. That probably doesn't happen without dysfunction. How could it? Human beings are involved. Over time, Samuel did listen, or rather, yes, over time, Samuel listened to God and his mama. Eli's sons didn't listen to God or their father. Karen Pidcock Lester a Presbyterian pastor, spots four affirmations in this passage about children, worship, and religion. One, our children are not our own. They belong to God. So-called helicopter parents don't like to hear that. And I've never encountered this, but I've read that some moms and dads persist in anxious parenting, not only into college, but through it actually calling business owners and managers trying to get their fully grown adult children hired or get them a raise or get them better benefits. I can't imagine. Pastor Karen points out that Hannah and Elkanah, on the other hand, model the kind of parenting that Christian parents vow to undertake when we stand at the baptismal font with our little ones. When our children are baptized, we rejoice that they are marked as God's own forever. That means... That means God may have plans that parents don't know about or can't even imagine. And that kind of love can hurt too. Trusting God and your children as if they know what's best for themselves. That kind of pain can come back at Christmas time. When our Ashley moved out and to Oklahoma State, it was over mom's protests. She wanted her to stay home and take classes at UCO at Edmond. I wanted Ashley to move out on her own if she wanted, even if it was just to a dorm room 50 miles away, which it was at first. But even I never thought she'd move as far away as she did and stay. And I ache sometimes. Such is the cost of pain and love. But our children are not our own. They belong to God. Hannah and Elkanah and Samuel remind us of that. Two, God is already preparing the future. Pastor Karen tells it like it is because 1 Samuel tells it like it is. Eli's sons are scoundrels. Their father is faithful, but they don't care at all. Eli's sons are corrupt. They have failed to do the Lord's will and work. But God does not let their faithlessness thwart the divine purposes. 
Even before God's judgment has been passed on the sons, God is already preparing a solution to the ruptures their sin has caused. God chooses Samuel. God's judgment falls within and is bound by God's love. I want to say that again because I had to read it twice myself and think about it. God's judgment falls within and is bound by God's love. Redemption is often underway, someone said, before judgment even begins. Thanks be to God. Because as Pastor Karen says, we too are scoundrels. We rebel against God. There's much in us and in the world that's corrupt. But God will not let our sin thwart God's great purposes. God is already preparing our future and the future of the whole creation. Good thing, because I can't see the future. You know, I said I couldn't imagine our Ashley moving so far away and staying. I couldn't have imagined all the good she and her husband are doing. Sorry. Heart. Heart is swelling. Your heart swells and chokes you up a little bit, doesn't it? <clears throat> I could not have imagined how she's turned out. The school they founded, the kids they're helping raise, the Montessori school. And for animals, both their own menagerie that they have at home and pets and companions at the vet clinic where she's worked for 10 years. <clears throat> By the way, she just quit her job without another one in hand. I'm not worried. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little, but God's got the whole world in his hands, and that includes her. Thank God. Uh, three, we grow in favor with the Lord through life in a worshiping community. We grow in favor with the Lord through life in a worshiping community. And yes, that may be hard to hear if your grown kids don't come to church. I came back to church just as Ashley moved out. And went to college. I had no idea how or if the relationship I have with her would be different had I been churchy when I met her mom. Don't know. Or if I'd come back to church when she was a tween and not literally headed out to college to her be an adult. But see, I can't see back into the might have been past any more than I can see into the might be future. It's all in God's hands and it's all in God's heart and it's all in God's plans not mine, but I hope and pray that they decide to go to church. Nobody comes fully formed into the Christian life, Pastor Karen notes. Samuel grew both in stature and in favor with the Lord and with men, it says. And then in the Luke passage, even Jesus, having apparently held his own with teachers in the temple, still increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man, it says. And Jesus never lost the temple habit. Samuel matured into his faith and ministry by being part of a living, worshiping congregation. He had a guide and mentor in Eli. He worshiped regularly in the temple. And he was surrounded by the company of God's people. As Pastor Karen exclaims, would that every boy and girl and every man and woman were so richly blessed. Four. Our children have a place in the worship of God. Samuel was ministering before the Lord. The linen ephod it mentioned, it's a liturgical garment. The boy had an official and particular job during worship. And children should. Lighting candles, reading scripture, doing something. And I personally think they need to stay in worship too, not go off by themselves. And I pray that that becomes an issue for us because right now it's not. Dear God, lead some families with children to us. I would love to have a precocious 12-year-old around to help keep us on our toes like 12-year-old Jesus did in the temple. That's what, <laughs> that's what Mary and Joseph got for being devoted to God and a life of worship and service. Note to anyone who claiming to be, quote, spiritual but not religious, Anyone who thinks they don't need church and they're finished with organized religion, but they love Jesus, uh, Jesus went to temple. 
Jesus read and heard the scrolls of scripture and Jesus practiced religion, organized, faulty but faithful religion. If you love Jesus, go to church. The Holy Family is our example. In this passage from the Gospel of Luke, one scholar points out that Jesus has a mother and father who care for him. They are part of a larger community that honors religious tradition. They were in Jerusalem for Passover, and they went with their friends and their extended family. He honors these relationships. He matures and grows. He listens, learns, and teaches eventually as time passes from one stage to the next. All along the way, the temple was central to Jesus' life and his religion helped him decide who his family was. Blood may be thicker than water, and that's an old saying about family, but when it comes to family relations, people do get to decide how, whether, and with whom to relate. We've seen that, some of us, in painful ways the past five years because of god-awful politics. And something's wrong when a religion causes family, dysfunctional or not, to contract. With Jesus, religion caused his ideas of family, dysfunctional and not, to expand. He learned that from his faithful parents. First, they were traveling in a caravan of extended family and friends. They lost track of Jesus, but only because they could and did trust others to help keep up with him. It took a village. <laughs> Judging from the way he sort of smart-mouthed his mama, if anybody else had tried to drag him out of the temple before he was ready to go, they'd have gotten an earful too. How is it you sought me? Did you not know I must be in my father's house? Can't you just hear the 12-year-old boy attitude? Jesus did increase in wisdom and in stature, it says, in favor with God and man. But in the meantime, it says, Mary and Joseph did not understand who does? Jesus was in the temple getting his mind and heart expanded. His family now included the teachers in his father's house. His family included all of Israel. And then later in Luke, Jesus, Jesus expands his family beyond the people of Israel to offer the good news of God's love to all with ears to hear, Jew and non-Jew. That's brother Jesus what the family were part of, extended the Trinity family, the Presbyterian family, the broader church family, the family of humanity. We are intrinsically beautiful because each of us bears the image of God. And together in the church, we believe, though we are wholly human, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. At times, we are truly lovely faulty yet faithful family. And sometimes when we get ourselves out of the way for the sake of others, we're even functional. Amen.